this evening. Um, what we're going to do is have a look at this. Um, we've done this uh, model of the transformer, detailed model of the transformer. We're going to look at how we can do a couple of practical tests to determine those um, parameters for the iron losses, the magnetizing current, and for the um, resistance of windings and the, 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 leak, the leakage flux. We'll look at that, then we're going to and, and do an example problem on that. Then we're going to analyze the rig single phase transformer using those open and closed circuit tests and actually prove that that model works and that does, it's reliable in the sense that it'll, it will predict what that, that transformer is going to do. Okay. So beyond that, we may well sort of kind of scratch into a little bit of revision later, later on in the session today that we'll carry on next week and the week after. All right, that will culminate in a full practice paper with work solutions for you to finish off maybe after the session in two weeks' time. But we'll, we'll see how far we get. All right, there is only one practice paper. Right, determine transformer impedances practically. Values of the loss impedances in a real transformer model can be determined through um, a practical experiment, which involves two tests being made. Firstly, you do an open circuit test. You measure the power input, the primary and secondary terminal voltages, and the primary current. Okay, so that's one test. And then you do a short circuit test, measuring the power input, the primary terminal voltage, and the primary current. The second one you have to be a bit careful with because you're short circuit in the secondary, and so if you're not careful, a lot of current would flow. So you don't do that at nominal primary voltage. You do that at a reduced voltage. I think we'll be using about four. I think we used about 40 volts for the open circuit, for the closed circuit test last time I've done this practical. So what you actually use is of no real consequence as long as you don't overload um, the output of the transformer. Okay. So, and the, and, and the way that you can calculate that is to um, make sure you stay within the VA rating of the transformer with the, uh, the secondary. So, on the, on the next page, we're going to start to go into the detail with regard to how those tests give you, um, allow you to calculate what you need to know in terms of the parameters. This little diagram here shows what we're interested in in terms of open circuit performance is the value of RC and the value of XN. If we know them, we can evaluate open circuit performance. Yeah? So, if we look at this circuit up here, we've got a watt meter measuring the, the, the power. We've got a volt meter there, measuring the um, input terminal voltage, and we've got an ammeter in line measuring a primary current, and all we've got connected to the secondary is a voltmeter measuring the secondary voltage. Okay, yes, that's going to draw a minuscule current, but the, the internal impedance of that is something like 20 mega ohms, so effectively that's open circuit. Okay, from that. We've got a power reading to give us the power loss in watts. That's going to be what the um, heat and loss in our core is. We've got apparent power applied by the source. So we can take the phase voltage, EP, and IP measured there, multiply them together. We've got the apparent power. We can then use that. We then, if we know the power and we know S, we've got this triangle, so we can find Q. Yeah. The resistance then representing the core loss. This resistor here is given by this voltage squared divided by the power. We just rearranging 
P is equal to E squared over R. Find R. Yeah. Because all that resistance represents the watts lost in open circuit condition. And then lastly, magnetizing reactants is EP squared over Q. So we concentrate on that will give us the value of XM. So we're isolating those two components. The R gives us the power loss. The XM gives us the Q loss. Like that, Richard? Yeah. It's all around this, this triangle here. And then lastly, if we're going to do this model, we need to know what the basic terms ratio I is. We can get that from EP over ES. So that if we if we do that test and that test we will be doing, that the measurements will be taken and recorded. Power, current and voltage primary and voltage output secondary, that'll be what we measure on the open circuit test. Okay? Yeah. Right. Short circuit test. No. This is what we're going to use model-wise to analyse it. It's our very highly simplified full model of a transformer. So what's happened here is everything on the secondary has been transferred across. So there's our um, R1, X1, R2 dash, X2 dash. The load is a, is a short circuit, remember? Because we're short circuit on the output. And then all that's been done, all we're assuming is, remember I said, if you're not interested in the values of these individual components and the voltage drop across them, you can add those two resistors to, to make just R. And you can add these two inductors to just make just X. So that's the completely simplified model in terms of all the losses for on, uh, on load um, analysis have been added together into a simply one R and one X. Both okay with that? Yeah? So on the short circuit test, we measure the primary power short circuit with a watt meter, the primary current at short circuit secondary with a cut with an ammeter, and the primary voltage short circuit with a voltmeter. And all we've got in this side is a link. Right, we can get the complete impedance, that's the value of those two, they you know, break up ZP from the secondary current, uh, sorry, the secondary voltage divided by the secondary current. Okay. Transformer resistance, referred to the primary, is the power divided by the current squared. Yeah, so that's rearranging P is equal to I squared R, rearranging that for R. That will give us the value of this component. Okay. And then... What we've got is, we've got a triangle then, where we know um, S, sorry, we know uh, the, the, the Z, we know R, we can find X. So that's the related triangle to the other one. Yeah. Resistant, this is the impedance triangle, the one we talked about on the other page, is the power triangle. And always remember that for the same circuit, the two angles in this bit here in there will always be the same. So using Pythagoras theorem there, we'll find out the value of X. What we then have as a model of this transformer 
we can then use to analyse how it will perform under a particular load with a 50 ohm resistor connected to it or whatever. So, that's example three, because originally this bit was tagged on the end of what we did last week. Okay. Um, example of using open and closed circuit tests. So, a short circuit, an open circuit test, is carried out on a 500 kVA, 600 kV, 454. So, it's a 500 kVA, nominal... Um, Apparent power, nominal S, 69 kV primary, 4.16 kD secondary at 60 Hz. So the following results. On open circuit, primary voltage, 69 kV, power 5 kilowatts, current 0.15 of an amp, secondary voltage, 4.160 volts. And then we got short circuit re results. Voltage, power, and secondary current are uh, uh, high short circuit of 4 amps. Okay. Use this data to produce a simplified model of the transformer and find values representing the core resistance, the magnetizer reactants, voltage at secondary terminals with this load connected. So the active path to a load of per resistance of 50 ohms. So we're going to analyze, use, use that data to come up with a model for that transformer and analyze what it, what it um, delivers for a load of 50 ohms. Yep. Find the power supplied by the source and the efficiency of the transformer under these conditions. All right? So we're going to go through that step by step now. Yep. So I've produced that little diagram of what we would, if we were doing this, and we're going to do it later on the um, on the other transformer. It's not 69 kV, by the way. Be pleased to know. Right, so what we're going to do first is look at the open circuit situation. PM is given to us. 5 kilowatts. So we just make that statement. And then we said we can find... SM from EP times IP. S is always the volts times the amps. Sixty-nine times ten to the three are applied by zero point one five. So we can calculate what the apparent power is from current multiplied by um, voltage. So that's, in this case, 69 kilovolts times 0.15 amps. Solution to that, 10350 VA. We can then use that to find, because we've now got two sides of the power triangle, we've got P, 5,000, and we've got S, 10350, that means we can find the missing side Q.
it is root s squared minus p squared ten three fifty squared minus five thousand squared and whatever that equals. I'm sure you'll tell me in a minute. What the um what we then use is the formula related to P is equal to E squared over R on Q is equal to E squared over X. Yeah. Could to use that to find the values of these two, these two components R and X in the open circuit model. Runs representing the magnetizing current and the heat and loss in the core. So we can rearrange, we can say that the value of RC is equal to EP squared over uh, P M That's 69,000 squared over 5,000. Power loss in the core will be represented by a resistor of value 952 kilo ohms. Yeah. Consequently, XM the, the, the parallel inductor is EP squared over Q, 69,000 squared over 9062. Yeah. Or to three significant figures. 525 kilos. Yeah. The last thing we get from the open circuit um, measurements is a transformer ratio a is equal to EP over ES. 69,000 over That's exact, is that out reoccur or anything like that? That's what I got. Yeah, okay. Five, eight, yeah, round to six. That's fine. Yeah. So that's the um, transformer ratio A. Okay. So what we've got in model wise from that test is that the open circuit situation with this transformer. like so. With the component values of I here 16.6 .6. this is 4160 volts this is 69 kilovolts and we've got 952k and 525k are those two components. Yep. So if we wanted a model 
the um, open circuit situation of those transformers that are values. Any questions before we move on to the short circuit test? Okay, the short circuit test is going to help us to find the um, series parameters for the model in of the transformer on load. It's done, as we said earlier, a reduced voltage. So we're looking at this transformer when the tests were done, and an imaginary test here. But although the primary um, nominal voltage is 69 kilovolts, applied a primary voltage of 2,600 volts to keep the current in the secondary down because it's short circuited. So we found, took measurements with an EP of 2,600. The power measured in the, um, in the short circuit um, situation in the primary was 2,400 watts with a short circuit primary current of 4 amps. Yep. From doing that, so this is the on load situation or short circuit situation. What we're looking at here is a circuit like this, e.g. When it's all transferred to the primary and joined together, we've got RP and XP there, and this is the short circuit represent on the secondary side being short circuited. So it's this. This is our, uh, in our terms, we've been using R1 and R2 transferred from the pr secondary to primary. This is X1 and X2 transferred to the secondary and added together. He said last week we could simplify that model down as long as we weren't interested in the individual components and the voltages across them. Okay? So we combine all the, lo all the on load losses together. All right. Using that um, circuit, what we can determine is the following. The impedance under these conditions must be ESC over ISC, i.e. impedance is voltage divided by current Ohm's law. 2600 from the test divided by 4 amps from the test equals and the power by 2,400. Answer. I make it 150. Oh, hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. What have I done? 2,400 over 4 squared. I've rearranged it the wrong way around. Hundred and fifty in it. That's better. Or we'll put the other one on. Or 
RP is equal to D squared times P. Am I right? No, E squared over P. Those two change places. Does that give you the same result? Voltage was 2,600. over 2,400. Does that give you the same result? Should do, I think. Man over there told me that was a sign. You've got to use just the voltage across that component. And that's not the voltage you're using. Yeah? You're using that voltage. But the current is the current that's going through it because there is only one current. In the other example, in the, in the open circuit, remember, that's generally the voltage you use, go down to the model, because the voltage is the voltage for each individual component. The current through them is different. The difference between series, in series, the current is is the same for all components. In parallel, the voltage is the same for all components. Yep. And even I must remember that because I need to get it across to you. But, you know, we got it now. There's always a way to explain it. So you just, it's a matter of knowing, really. You just got to know that you're. Because you're isolating that one component to find that resistor and ignoring the inductor, you can't use the voltage because the voltage is across both of them. All right? Have I have I cleared that issue up sufficiently? Can you you can't use V times uh, power of volts times current because the voltage and current are not in phase with each other. And again, the voltage is not the voltage just across that one component. All right? We and we haven't measured that because we can't measure that. We can measure this voltage here. Okay? So we got the value of the resistor, 150 ohms. Okay? What we can also find now is we have two sides of the impedance. Triangle. So the, the other example used the power triangle. What we've got now is two sides of this triangle where that is Z, that is R, and we can now find X. So Z was 650 ohms, R is 150 ohms. So we can get x p is equal to the square root of z p squared minus r p squared. Square root of 650 squared minus 150 squared 
equals. Anyone? Six, 632 ohms will do me. Right? So, we've, we've got a situation now where We've got a model. I'm going to I'm going to go on to a new page that looks like this. Sixty nine KV. There is equal to 150 ohms. X, 632 ohms. And we're going to analyze it with a load like so. And the, the actual value of the load, ZL, given in the question, is equal to 50 ohms. How do I find what its value is transferred to the, to the primary side? Because that's got to be ZL dash. from last week. What do we multiply it by? We've done that in, in the open circuit test, didn't we? Yeah, well, it's the same transformer, yeah? 16.6. So we multiply as A squared times ZL 60 16.6 squared times 50. Um, sorry? 69 kV. No, no. Oh, total impedance for this circuit. We've got, we got three impedance components in there, two resistors, and an inductor, an inductive reactants. Yeah? So that's all those added together, is it not? It is ZL dash plus RP plus... Right? But what's special about XP? Yep, got to put that J on there, haven't we? So, that's 1, 3, 7, 7, 8 for the ZL dash. Plus 150. Plus 632J. Ohms. Add those two numbers together. One three nine two eight plus six three two J. And for good measure, 
we better have it in polar form as well. Might need it. What can we find now that we've found the, t found the total impedance of the circuit reflected for the primary side? What will that allow us to find? This is how you got to build an you got to build an analysis of this circuit stage by stage. find that now. Could I find it before I had the total impedance? What voltage? The, the only voltage you've got here is the voltage across all three components connected in series. So I can only use that voltage if I've got the total impedance. See that? So that's why I calculated that. Now I can find the current flowing. If I know what the current flowing is, I can then isolate this component and find E2 dash and then transfer it back the other side and I've got the secondary voltage under load. That's where we're heading with this. Alright, that's about working your way through the problem step by step, finding one value to then allow you to find another value. So we can now find IP from Ohm's law, BP over ZT. That's 69,000 divided by 13942 angle 3.6 degrees. Yeah, 4.95 amps angle minus 2.6. Does negative angle ring true here? Civil, inductive circuit, current, lagging, voltage. Yes. All right. Now we know the current, what else can we find? The apparent power, yes. The S supplied by the generator is equal to Volts times amps. That's 4.95 angle minus 2.6 times 69,000 angle zero. Answer is VA angle, yep. and we could take that to three hundred and forty two KVA angle. 2.6, three significant figures. So they, um, 
generators providing that much current power. Okay. Can anyone see how we can get the, think of how we can get the watts and the vars from that? Think along the lines of this. You could do all individual calculations, but there's a quicker way than that. What's the two ways of expressing this S phaser here? Two different ways of expressing that complex number. polar rectangular so if you make it rectangular do that now the real bit will be the power because remember what a rectangular number is, is how many across how many up or down yeah so if we make that if we convert that number there to rectangular we'll have watts I want to have vars. The real part will be the watts. Imaginary part will be the vars. Well, you can do it the other way if you want, but spend more time on it. But Don't worry. I'm going to make it too difficult for you. So if we convert that value for S in polar form there, VA, to rectangular form, real part, imaginary part, the real part is the power in watts, the imaginary part, and the Q in vars. We're going to want the power later being delivered by the real power being delivered by the generator to get the efficiency out of this thing. I told you, I said all along, these triangles are the key, the whole key to the math in this module, and understand of them. Right? So, continuing on now, to carry on, what we're going to do now is find... I2, the actual current flowing in the secondary using our model. This current value here is I1, but that is also equal to I2 dash, remember. They are the same currents in this circuit. find I2 dash by 
dividing the current I2 by A, therefore I2 must be I2 dash times A. Read. We want to transfer the current I2 from the secondary to the primary. We divide by A. Therefore, to go back the other way, we must multiply by A. So I2 is equal to 16.6, .6, the transformer ratio, times 4.95 angle minus 2.6 degrees. And I make that 82.2 amps angle minus 2.6 degrees. One. Does that look right in terms of the angles are same? Yes, because an ideal transformer does not affect phase angle at all. Perfect. Okay. And does that ring true for a step up transformer that the current in the secondary is higher than that in the primary? Step down transformer voltage goes down, current must go up. So again, now it's all little knowledge things that say, it does that look like the right answer? Yeah. So that's the um, secondary current actually flowing in this transformer. The next bit says, find E2. There's two ways we could look at this. So I'm going to split the board here for a minute and do them both. We can either say E2 dash is equal to uh, IP times uh, ZL dash yep. so I said we know the current going through it now we can find just just the voltage across there so we can go that route that is 4.95 angle minus 2.6 degrees times the impedance 13778 I make that 68201 angle minus 2.6 degrees. Then we've got to transfer that to the secondary. So E2 dash is equal to E2 times A. Therefore, E2 is E2 dash over A. That is 68210 angle minus 2.6 divided by 16.6. Bet you do. 4.95. 
4018 volts angle minus 2.6 degrees. Right. All that, can anyone see? A much quicker way of doing it. So, you could get, find an, to find E2, you could use the parameters on the primary side to find E2 dash, and then, which is that value there, and then transfer it back across to the other side with the transformer ratio, get 4018 volts. But, because we've already calculated the secondary current in the earlier part, we can use that with the, the load resistor to do a direct E2 as I times RL, 8, 82.2 uh, times 50, 4,110 4, volts. So, sometimes there's more than one way to do it, but also sometimes one of them two ways is easier than the other. But ultimately, it's only ever practice that will get you to know which one, just which one's better. Because you could have done, we could have done, E2 first instead of I2, which as you've seen is a little bit more tricky, but then we could have used E2 direct with the load to find I2. So whichever way we, we've done that round, once you're transferred one of them across, then the other one is easy. It don't really matter which one you do first. All right? I'm sure you're all really confused now. Just to finish off, because of what the question asked in the first place was, what we can say is because the load is purely resistive. Yep. E2 and I2 are in phase. Yep. Okay. So although they've both got an angle, they're both the same. Therefore, S2 and P2 are equal. Magnitudes are equal. I.e., we can ignore the angles. That's why I've given you a purely resistive load, and I will only give you a purely resistive load in the exam. So, S2 is equal to E2 times I2. Which is 82.2 amps times E2 was 4110 volts. What will that come to? VA equals three three seven eight four two watts for RL. Yep. Efficiency. P out. Of a P in will shorten that to three three 
eight kilowatts divided by and the input was three four one kilowatts times a hundred equals so three hundred and thirty eight over three four one you can ignore the killer. Ninety nine point one per cent efficient. Not sure how highly that example has that transformer loaded. Uh, Five hundred KVA. So we're looking about three fifths loaded. Transformers ninety ninety nine point one percent efficient. <laughs> not fully loaded at that level. Three fifths. Yeah. Right, I uh, know that's a lot. Would you like to have a coffee now before we move on? I know you'd like to go home, so would I, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs>